The Sign, Bell, and Lemon, one of my favorite classics in all of magic. And the reason is simple, impact. I've performed the Bill and Lemon literally thousands of times since 1984, and I have found three very important things. First is the amazement factor. The audience is absolutely stunned when that sign bill comes out of the lemon. The second thing is, when they go back and try to think about how this is possible, it's impossible. They have nowhere to go. And lastly, this is a reputation maker. That's the reason it stayed in my act all these years. People remember this a long, long time, well after the performance is forgotten in most cases. This is incredibly valuable to a professional magician because this is how you get those extra shows. Now, in 1984, when I started doing the routine, it was strictly because of Steve Spill. Now, Steve worked at the Brook Farm Inn of Magic with my buddy Bob Sheets, and back in the heyday of the Brook Farm, Every night there were many, many performances to witness, but the most memorable ones for me were Bob Sheets' Card Stab and Steve Spill's Bill and & Lemon. And Steve's framework for the Bill & Lemon has become the framework that many pros have used, including myself, Doc Eason, and now Scott Alexander. And we have to thank Steve very much for allowing all of us to, to work with his children, because without Steve, this wouldn't exist at all. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank some other close friends. Uh, the doctor, Doc Eason, up in Aspen, Colorado, was kind enough to share his uh, gag with the, the knife. And Al Garber, I won't blow what the gag is because it's very, very funny and you probably aren't familiar with this one. It's sort of a, a great middle gag, though, that cements a part of the routine that usually is a little stale in most people's hands. And lastly, the final gag in the Fitzgerald's performance you'll soon see is from Dr. Steve Bedwell, a dear friend of ours from Orlando, Florida, and England. And uh, Steve came up with a great tagline to finish off the routine. It's sort of the icing on the cake. Now, hopefully you haven't looked at the gaff just yet. We're hoping that you'll watch the show so you don't know the exact method. But if you have, you'll, you'll know what it is. And this gaff, in my mind, is incredible for the simple reason that it is the final answer. There's no better method I've tried over 30 myself. I've tried everybody else's routines and work. This is the real McCoy. This is the one you're going to be using for many, many years. It's incredibly practical. And um, the gaff itself is, was Scott's idea. We worked on it hard to improve the concepts of the building. But Thomas Wayne, once again, has not only taken our stringent specifications and exceeded them by a mile. Uh, it's a piece of artwork, as you'll soon see. Now, the training DVDs themselves are very, very comprehensive. In fact, there's well over three hours of information packed into these two DVDs that you now hold in your hands. You're going to find that, uh, so you don't get confused, I want you to understand that on the first DVD, you're going to find a show live at Fitzgerald's. Then you're going to have all sorts of little segments that deal with uses of the gaff, care and cleaning of the gaff, uh, preparing the lemon, and all these critical pieces of information that you need to know. The second disc is going to contain, once again, the Fitzgerald's routine, so you don't have to go back and watch it on the first DVD, because the second DVD, Scott goes through each and every aspect of setting it up and performance. It's over 45 minutes in length. And also contained are two bonus routines, a close-up routine and a routine that you can use in a parlor situation. Now, one thing you're going to find with the final answer is, really, you can do the stage version close-up. You can almost do any routine in any situation because the method is angle-proof and pretty much foolproof and very easy to do. So the reason we gave you this comprehensive information is hopefully you'll take the routines that are included on the DVD and personalize them and make them into you because there's many, many other methods and techniques that you can use with the final answer that are included that we couldn't fit into the three routines. So look at your personality, look at your performing venues, and try to analyze those situations and put the pieces together and build your final answer. Hello. I'm Scott Alexander, and welcome to The Final Answer. Now, over the years, hundreds of magicians have attacked the plot of Bill and Lemon to come up with the best method. And for me, this has become my final answer, and I hope it becomes your final answer very soon.
Now, before we get started, and before you look at the gaff, hopefully, I'd like to show you a live show so that you can see just how efficient, practical, and powerful this routine can really be. So let's take a look at a live show. In fact, there are slot machines designed for all different kinds of people. They got fish and frogs and Dracula and all kinds of stuff. So you have to know which ones to play. In fact, they even put brand new slot machines in just for the senior citizens. Really? Instead of cherries across the middle, it's got prunes across the <laughs> And there's a bonus. You get three prunes, you go straight to the craft table. <laughs> But speaking of money, uh, I would like to uh, borrow some for just a moment. Uh, does anyone have a $100 bill that I could borrow for just a moment? Who's got a $100 bill out there? Let's see who's got one. Anyone? Don't all jump at once. You, sir, do you have a $100 bill I could borrow? That's fantastic. Would you step right down here towards me? And everybody will give you a big round of applause. Let's hear it for us for putting up 100 bucks. Come on down. Fantastic. We can walk a little faster, that'd be fine. <laughs> what is your name? Would you stand right over here for me? What is your name again? Jeff. 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 And where are you from here, Jeff? Michigan. From Michigan. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Not so free with the cash there, are we? I promise, I promise, nothing will happen to your money. In fact, I've done this thousands of times and nothing ever happens. That much. Okay. Yeah. In fact, I have a pen here just to prove that nothing's going to happen. Everything is free and above board, and so you'll recognize this $100 bill if you ever see it again. <laughs> I'd like you to take the pen, and on the back of the bill there, Jeff, just write Jeff really big. Place the bill against my back, and just write Jeff really big. And then once you've printed your name, I'd like you to put your credit card number and sign it. <laughs> That's good. Good. I got a hitch right here. Did you get that too? Thanks so much. That's great. Now, uh, by the way, this is a permanent marker. Uh, it used to say that right there, but it rubbed off. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> but the ink doesn't rub off, right? Check that. Permanent. Good. And we'll hold it up to show everyone that you've just committed a felony. <laughs> Security. <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's good stuff. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was rude. Did you want some? <laughs> That's right, Jeff, yeah, yeah! Hey, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? <laughs> now we're going to uh, take the money, and I'm going to pull up the money, because we're going to uh, perform a little experiment with your $100 bill. And the reason it's called an experiment is because experiments are iffy. Tricks usually work. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to roll this into a nice tight wad. Uh, do you know what a tight wad is? <laughs> You'll pass on that. Well, it took you long enough to get up here with the money. I think you're enough. You're enough. Inside my pocket over here, I have a pair of these. I don't know what you would actually really use these for. <laughs> Oh, we have a couple of college graduates out there. <laughs> hey, did you ever go to one of those ear parties? <sighs> ear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, don't overdo it. <laughs> now, in case anything should happen to the money, I'll tell you what, Jeff, you get a prize, and this is your prize. Uh, it's the only prize I had. It's my lunch. My wife packed it for me, so let's see what wonderful delicacy she has packed for me today. Some lemons and a marshmallow. It's Atkins. <laughs> hey, you know what? My wife's not the best cook. In fact, in my house, we pray after we eat. <laughs> but uh, this is all yours. All these fabulous prizes are yours. If, if I can only have one marshmallow. Can I have one marshmallow? Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it. Reach in there and grab out one marshmallow for me. That's 
great, perfect. We'll seal the rest of this up. And now, since this is a very valuable prize, we need someone to look after the prize. And uh, that would be our bag man. I need the bag man. Let's see. You, sir, right there. We're going to staple this shut. What is your name? Tom. Tom? Yes. Tom, you're going to be the bag man. Ready to catch? Perfect. Excellent catch. <laughs> Play for the Michigan team. Right. <laughs> oh, come on now, baseball. I love you, Jeff. I love you. All right. Tom, <laughs> let's go blue. You have a very important job, Tom. You are going to be a part of this fabulous, fantastical, magical mystery tour, this play, this tour de force we're going to perform. You have the role of the beautiful Las Vegas showgirl. And as a beautiful Las Vegas showgirl, when I say who's got the bag, your job is to stand up, Face these folks over here and go, Yoo-hoo! I've got the bag! Mwah! <laughs> yeah, let's practice. <laughs> Wait till I say it. Wait till I say who's got the bag. Sit down, sit down. A little anxious there, Tom. Do you have the lines? Yoo-hoo! I've got the bag. And then blow a big kiss to these folks over here. You ready? Who's got the bag? Coming your way. <laughs> Do it just as good or better the next time I ask, all right? Perfect. Now, Tom, your money is going to, uh, I mean, Jeff, that's right, you're Tom. <laughs> good memory. <laughs> Who's that? Is there a guy sitting next to you? What's that guy's name? Norm. Norm, Norm how you doing? Right, yeah. Norm, you're going to back me up. You're going to be my bodyguard. In case Jeff starts looking a little angry, I need you to back me up. <laughs> you're going to be the guy with the knife. Take this knife. Take the knife, Norm. You have a very important job. In case Jeff starts looking angry like he's going to jump me, pull some karate or something, I'm going to say, who's got the knife? What? That's right, you do have the knife, but you're going to be my bodyguard, so you've got to be a tough guy. When I say, who's got the knife, you stand up, face all these nice folks over here and go, yo, over here. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> Who's got the knife? Yo, over here! <laughs> that Viagra must be kicking in, huh? <laughs> and make sure you really grab. I don't want to come down to come down there and do it for you. <laughs> Good job. All right, now, Jeff, here's the fun part. We're going to play a game. The reason I brought you up here is the whole crux of this experiment. I'll take the marshmallow for later, but right now, I am going to seal your money inside one of these envelopes. Your job, I'm going to charge you with psychic energy. If you guess the correct envelope, you win. Now sit down, Tom. Sexy. <laughs> hey, look at that. That wouldn't stick when I licked it earlier. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that to you. But here are two other envelopes from my pocket. One here and one here. These have something in them, pieces of paper. All right? Now, your job is to guess which envelope contains the money. But what is this all about? This is all about me giving you my psychic powers, my psychic energy for just a few moments so that you can correctly determine which one has your money in it. Are you ready to receive the psychic powers? Demons be gone! <laughs> Do you feel psychotic? Not psychic? <laughs> Do you feel psychic? Now you feel the energy coursing for you. Let's perform one test before we get down to the main event. I have written a word on this card before I came out here. Do you have any idea what word I wrote? No. No? Good idea. That is correct! <laughs> Nobody ever gets that. Yeah. Now, the choice is very important. You have to reach out and take one of these envelopes, but don't let me influence you as to which envelope you should pick. <laughs> It should be a free choice using your psychic energy. <laughs> that wasn't obvious. <laughs> now, I'll give you a chance. Would you like to trade for one of these two or keep the one that you have? <laughs> yeah, you can trade for one behind a curtain if you like. I don't care. All right. 
And the reason that the choice that you make is very important, because we're going to raise the stakes just a little bit. <laughs> you didn't think I was actually going to do anything, did you? <laughs> you fool. <laughs> Let's all sing Kumbaya. Oh, yeah. <laughs> envelope number one, gone forever. Now, one more chance. Would you like to take this envelope or keep the one you have there? All right, fair enough. Now, folks, let's recap what has just happened. <laughs> we gave our lovely Las Vegas showgirl a bag. We gave Norm out there the knife. Jeff signed his name on some money. We sealed it in one of three envelopes. And Jeff, using his newfound psychic powers, has determined which envelope contained his money. Now, for the first time, tear that envelope open and show everyone that you definitely have the power within you. This show's worth a hundred I'm going to 
touch it now. <laughs> There's your deposit. Reach inside there and take off the plastic bag for me, Jeff. Okay, hand it to me right here. Now, Jeff, remember, this was in the audience the entire time. What I'd like you to do is please reach in there and remove that lemon. Nice job. Hand me the knife. Slowly. <laughs> hand me the lemon. Now, as you can see, this is an absolutely ordinary lemon. No holes, no cuts. This is an absolutely ordinary knife. Nothing funny. This has been in the entire, entire time out in the audience. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut this open and take out the seeds. And if you take those seeds back to Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> and play them in your front yard, a mighty tree will throw them out. I'm grateful. I cut the silver all the way around, being careful not to damage anything that might be inside. Now, folks, I guarantee you will not forget this for a very long time. Reach over there very slowly, Jeff, and pull the top of that. you enjoyed the show and I hope the method fooled you. Uh, this has fooled many of the top professionals in magic who have come to see my show. The most important thing about this is that the load and the switch is like a rattlesnake bite. It happens at the most unexpected moments and it happens so fast. That's one of the great things about the final answer is its efficiency. Now if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the gaff, and I hope you haven't, uh, you might want to take it out now and take a look at it because we're going to break it down and show you the exact moment that the bill was switched and loaded. And the great thing about this is the switches and loads can happen in a close-up routine, a parlor routine, and a stage routine. So let's go back and watch the show so you can see exactly where the sneaky stuff happened. Now I'm about to switch a bill that has been previously loaded inside the final answer pen for the spectator's actual signed bill. We're going to uh, perform a little experiment with your $100 bill. And the reason it's called an experiment is because experiments are iffy. Tricks usually work. <laughs> now, uh, we're going to roll this into a nice tight wad. Uh, do you know what a tight wad is? <laughs> You'll pass on that. Well, it took you long enough to get up here with the money. I think you're done. You're done. It's really deceptive, isn't it? And it happens so smoothly. It's easy to do. In fact, anyone can do it. At this point in the routine, the spectator's signed bill is already in the final answer pen. And now, I'm going to load it into the lemon right in front of everybody. And this is the rattlesnake bite. Some lemons and a marshmallow. It's Atkins. <laughs> hey, you know what? My wife's not the best cook. In fact, in my house, we pray after we eat. <laughs> yep, that's right. I just loaded the lemon right through the walls of the plastic bag. Well, now that you've got an overview of how everything goes together, I'd like to break it down and teach you the finer points so that the final answer becomes the last bill and lemon method you will ever need, no matter where you work. The whole bill and lemon plot always fascinated me. Uh, as a kid, when I performed shows, I learned it out of the Mark Wilson book. And uh, it never failed to get a strong reaction, no matter what method I was using. But 
I knew there was something better out there. So years later, I ended up working for Bill Malone at his Magic Bar in Florida, and I decided to ring in the Bill and Lemon. But I would spend, uh, you know, an hour before the shows uh, loading bills into lemons with torn corners, sometimes up to 12 a night. And uh, that really didn't do it for me. I wanted to figure out a way to get a signed bill into the lemon to be able to have the lemon handled by the spectators and uh, do it as cleanly and efficiently as possible. Now, at Malone's, I came up with a special cut in the lemon that I call a star trap and we'll go into great detail about that later. But at Malone's, I did a chop cup routine close up and uh, produced the lemons, had the spectator choose uh, one of the lemons, and the bill was actually loaded in my pocket. But I wanted to have a way to load that lemon right in front of people. So uh, I came up with the final answer. Now I wanna be able to give credit here where credit is due. Uh, even though I came up with this idea independently, I wanted to make sure I covered my bases to see that something like this wasn't out there before. So what I did was I did a little research. Now, Max Molini, in his book, has a plunger method for the bill and lemon with a magic wand. And the wand basically shoots the money into the lemon through a big, gigantic hole. Uh, Audley Walsh also had a similar method for card in orange. Now, in Sam Sharp's book, uh, Conjurer's Mechanical Secrets, which is the definitive uh, book on secrets uh, that are mechanical in application to conjuring, uh, talks about billet knives, uh, plungers and injection devices such as egg vases that shoot a ring up into an egg or, uh, or a magic wand uh, or a pen that's used as a billet switch, but nothing in an application like this. My real inspiration for the pen came from Tim Conover and Scotty York's Bill and Cigarette. However, in that routine, the cigarette is signed and the bill has a torn corner. And the pen itself is not a plunger or injection device. It's simply a holdout space to switch the cigarettes out. Now, in my routine, I took the concept of Tim Conover's, which is uh, an in-the-hand switch, using a pen to get rid of the uh, one object and bring the other object into play. But I also wanted that device to be able to load the signed bill into the lemon, which is where I developed the plunger idea. Now, after leaving Malone's, I went on a cruise ship uh, with a crude version of this that I made myself and uh, started working on it and working on it. And then, the prop went to Thomas Wayne and he took it to a whole new level. And that's the way I've been doing it ever since, the method that you have in your hands right now. And we're going to take a look at that method and go over it in detail so you can see exactly how to get that bill switched and get it into the lemon as quickly, efficiently, and slyly as possible. This is the final answer. Now, I know it looks like an ordinary Sharpie, and uh, hopefully now you've taken a look at the gaff. Uh, Thomas Wayne has gone to great lengths to research everything involved in this pen through the Stanford Pen Company, because this is actually made from a real Sharpie. Now, we have shortened the ink cartridge just a bit, so the uh, pen will actually write as a real writing implement for approximately 1,000 signatures. Now, of course, this is an evaporative device, so uh, the longer the cap is off, the shorter the lifespan is. So do try to keep it capped as much as possible. But this should last you a good long time. Uh, if the pen does happen to run out of ink, you can always send it back to Bob Kohler Productions, and uh, you have to send the pen back. But we will send you a new one for a nominal fee, so you never have to worry about the ink running out. And also, we have some pen switches. So if you don't actually want to write with this pen, you don't have to. You can use an ordinary Sharpie and then bring this into play later and we'll show you how to do that. Now I'd like to talk about the pen in specific detail. Uh, first of all, uh, the plastic of a Sharpie pen is, uh, is rather cheap uh, because they're made in mass quantity. So the pen had to be reinforced. So what Thomas Wayne has done is put a brass tube inside the pen itself. Now, this is not an ordinary brass tube. It has been tapered, uh, especially, to 
to accommodate the tapering of the Sharpie. Because when you just look at a Sharpie at a casual glance, it looks like the sides are straight. But they actually taper a few degrees, and that was very difficult to figure out. Uh, the ink cartridge itself, the reason you can't really replace the ink in it is because it has been sealed to ensure that this pen will actually write and no leakage of air will come out to, to dry the pen out. So a phenolic plug was actually placed up inside and phenolic is a very special type of plastic that's been cut with some, uh, some ridges so that when the chamber here and the chamber here are combined with the brass tube and fused together with a very special glue, uh, there's no way that this will break, come apart, or dry out from the inside. The only way it'll dry out is if you leave the cap off. Now the slit that allows the plunger to move back and forth inside the pen that facilitates the injection into the lemon. Uh, the plunger is uh, actually made from Delrin plastic. Uh, the button itself and the plunger down here, which I'll mention in a moment, is made from the Delrin. It's uh, one of the strongest plastics out there, so this will not break on you. Uh, the slit itself, the groove inside that allows the plunger to move back and forth is actually cut precisely on a computer lathe. So these are uh, exact and precise and there's no movement or wiggling whatsoever. It's, uh, it slides very smoothly. Now the end of the brass tube here is also beveled and the reason it's beveled and machined is to facilitate the bill actually sliding into the pen so you hit it every time 100 percent. It guides it right into the end. And the button itself at the end of the pen here is also Delrin. It's one unit uh, attached here to the button itself. Uh, this plug actually extends about an eighth of an inch past the end of the Sharpie. And that accomplishes two things. One, it uh, prevents people from seeing up inside the pen when the plunger is down. And number two, it facilitates getting that bill into the lemon that extra eighth of an inch. So it really sends it home. Uh, also, the button itself here that you're going to actually push on is grooved. So it has what I like to call gription. It has grip and it has friction, so it allows you to uh, have a little bit of a grip there, a uh, slight grip when using the plunger. Uh, that's the details on the pen itself. Uh, as I said, hundreds of hours have gone into bringing this to you. Uh, it's a very clever and diabolical device, and now we'll show you its applications. Now one last thing I'd like to mention before we move on is the cleaning and care of the pen. Uh, there is a chance, of course, that during the routine some lemon juice or orange juice will get into the chamber of the pen, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, lemon juice and orange juice do contain citric acid and they are slightly corrosive, uh, but it would take a very, very long time for that small concentrated amount of uh, acid to, to corrode the brass tube. Uh, so what you want to do is after your performance, uh, simply rinse out the pen, uh, leave the cap on of course so you don't get the uh, point wet, but leave the cap on and rinse it out under a tap or a faucet. Uh, or if you'd like to be very, very thorough, uh, dip it inside a glass of uh, warm, soapy water. Not a lot of soap, just a little bit, uh, and uh, rinse it out. And then make sure you dry it out good before the show, and uh, there you go. Now, also, sometimes if you do happen to forget and rush out of the show and leave it sitting there on your, uh, on your dressing table, uh, and somehow the lemon juice or the orange juice, the sugar content uh, might cause that uh, Delron plug to, to sort of fuse with a little sugar bond to the inside. Don't worry about it. Uh, if it's stuck, simply again take that glass of warm soapy water, dip the pen inside of it, let it sit there for about two or three minutes, and then work the plunger back and forth, back and forth, and it should free up nice and smooth. And then once you've done that, rinse it out again, you can take a little paper towel and, or a Q-tip, go up inside there, dry it out, and uh, you're good to go. So that's a little bit about the care and maintenance of your final answer pen. Now let's talk about the pen switches for just a moment. Now there are going to be some routines where you want to use the final answer pen and not switch it. For example, in the version with the gag and the close-up routine where you take the pen and say, you signed the money. I'm going to sign the lemon, you can have it as a souvenir. 
you're going to want to use the final answer pen for that part. Or if for some reason you'd like the spectators to sign the lemon, then by all means use the final answer pen. Or in the drawing the line gambit, when you actually draw the line around the lemon to have the spectator cut to follow it, that's a time when you're going to actually want to use the final answer pen too to write with. But uh, let's just explore a couple of simple switches you can do if you're not comfortable writing with the final answer pen. Now, the red pen will actually be the final answer pen. So the red's the final answer, and the normal Sharpie is the normal Sharpie. Here's a simple and bold switch. Have the final answer pen in your pocket. Have the Sharpie handed to the spectator. They sign the bill. And you simply ask the spectator to show the bill to the audience. Well, that's plenty of cover because all the audience's attention is devoted to looking at the signature. You very simply go into your pocket, leave the one pen, and come out with the other. No one's looking for it. It's just a pen. There's no big deal, and all the focus is on the signature. So that's one option. You could also opt for a comedic option. Keep the final answer pen in a breast pocket, per se. Have the Sharpie. and take it back from the spectator as they've signed it. Simply go, hey, thank you very much, so that's how I got it. Whatever gag you want to do, go into your pocket and say, no, just kidding. Switched just like that. Again, no big deal, happens on an offbeat. Uh, another one that uh, that'd be fun to explore is the uh, envelope switch. Uh, for this version, I will take the final answer pen here and clip it to the front side of an envelope that I'm going to use to burn the bill. So the clip would be in the back, and the pen on the front side. That way it doesn't look like it's clipped to the pen, it just looks like it's there in front. This then would go down inside my pocket over here. So now, after the spectator has signed the bill, I say, in my pocket, I have an envelope. Simply go into the pocket, leave the one, and come out with the other. It's an easy switch. And another fun one, uh, something to play around with, have the final answer pen in your right jacket pocket, and have a cell phone in your other pocket. And uh, once the spectator signs the money, you can say, oh, hold on a second. You've just committed a federal offense or whatever gag you're going to do and say, uh, in fact, I have a uh, cell phone here. I have the treasury agents on speed dial. <coughs> do, 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 do. <coughs> yes, is this Mr. Johnson from the treasury office? <laughs> yeah, Scott Alexander here, yes. We got another one. <laughs> yep, just put the check in the mail. Thanks. So you can do a funny gag like that, and the pen has been switched already. It happens so fast. And you can use the, uh, the crossing the gaze to, uh, to distract from here. But very simply, it's in the pocket. I'm just looking for something. Come right back out. It happens that quick. So those are a few ideas. If you don't want to write with the final answer pen, you can explore some of those pen switch options. Now I'd like to talk about the different kinds of folds. The first fold you're going to use 99% of the time. Uh, it was a fold that was created by Thomas Wayne to accommodate the, uh, the pen. Now, what you want to do is take a $100 bill. I always like to use a $100 bill. That's the ideal situation. Uh, and if you'll notice, on the back of the $100 bill, it says the United States of America, $100. Uh, well, I usually use the United States of America as a uh, reference point as to where to fold the bills. Uh, basically, you want to fold the bill into thirds so that you will accommodate the length of the slit in the pen. Here's how it works. Usually, on the if you're looking at the bill here, on the right-hand side, your right, if you're holding the bill like this, of the T is where the first fold is made. So there's the T on that particular side, you make the first fold, like that. That's a third of the bill. Then you'll notice that falls in line with the right-hand side of the M in America. And that's where the other fold is made. And that third goes right over here. Now that's just a reference point for you to, to get the bill exactly folded the right way. In uh, real time, on stage, I don't even bother to look at the United States of America because I've done this so many times, I can gauge it and fold the bill. And you could always just tweak it a little bit at the very end uh, with your thumbs by shifting it. So basically you want to fold the bill in thirds in this fashion. Now then, you would want to take and fold the bill in half along the crease like this. Just fold it up 
boom, down in half. So bring the top and the bottom together to form a rectangular packet. Now, it's very important to get the bill in as tight a package as you can get so that it, you easily can slide the bill into the pen. Uh, there are a few ways to do it. Uh, the original way that I do it, to make a small fold, a very tight little fold there. And now, keeping pressure with your finger, thumb, and middle finger, begin to roll the bill, pulling with this thumb as well, once you get it rolled, and squeezing tight, squeezing tight, squeezing tight all the way. Now that forms a very nice tight packet and I've got a lot of pressure here between my thumb and first finger to make sure that stays tight. If it doesn't stay tight it tends to want to open up like that and you will have some difficulty getting it in the pen. So make sure you fold it nice and tight. Um, you can also do a fold like this. You can fold it in half and then fold it in half again. This does work, but it's not as reliable as the roll. The roll is what you want. Now once it's rolled into a tight little packet, it's very easy to slide it into the pen. Now the original fold that I did when I first started developing this, when this routine was in its infancy, looked like this. And as you can tell, this is a lot shorter than this particular fold. Uh, this fold here works much better if you're cracking an egg and making a bill appear inside an egg. This fold is ideal. In the other fold, it's pretty much like a, uh, a standard bill switch type of fold. You're going to, uh, let's say, fold the bill in half, then fold the bill in half again, and then fold the top down until you get a square, and then you do that same rolling action. Roll, 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 roll and squeeze. Like that. And that gives you a little shorter bundle to work with. Uh, and that was the original way that I folded it. And then Thomas, of course, came up with a longer one. And the reason he came up with a longer one is that uh, he thought it would be a better idea, and I totally agree, that more of the bill is poking up out of the lemon so it reads further back to the audience. And I think that's a good point. Now, 99% of the time you are going to use this fold. But what happens in the rare instance that someone tries to throw a curveball at you and let's say gives you a, uh, a Canadian bill? Uh, or let's say you are in Canada or Japan or Australia, Great Britain or any of the countries in the, in the European Union. What are you going to do? Well, the great thing is that the final answer pen works with most every currency. Let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say you are in Hong Kong. Here's a Hong Kong dollar that we have. The whole idea is the initial folds that you make in the bill are going to, once they're folded, and thirds is usually a very good rule for most currencies. You just want to make sure that the length of the groove in the pen is longer than the bill itself. And uh, as you can see, when you fold bills into thirds, most of them do that. There are a few exceptions, something like the British pound or the Australian dollar. And the Australian dollar is, uh, has a little more of a plasticky feel to it. Uh, and there are a couple of ways you can get around that as well. But the basic idea is you want to make sure that that ratio, this is a little less than this. And this here is a little less than that. And then you can again fold and roll and roll and roll. Now let's say you uh, happened to be in Iraq and uh, you have the dinar there. Uh, this is uh, it's kind of interesting though that the Iraqi money was printed in the United States. It's got English uh, writing on it there. Kind of bizarre. But again, with a bill like this, it's a lot wider than a $100 bill. But that's okay. The only dimension you're really concerned with, unless this is huge, is getting a ratio of a fold like this being shorter than the slit. And, by the way, uh, this is not folded in thirds, it's folded in quarters, because if it was folded in thirds, it would be longer than the groove in the pen. And again, you can take this folded down and roll, 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 roll. 
And uh, the same thing. Let's say someone gives you a, uh, a bill from, uh, let's say Britain gives you a, a British pound. Uh, these can fit very, very tightly if you roll them. But something you might want to do is take the bill and the pen, give them to the spectator, have it signed, and have the spectator tear the bill in half and keep half the bill for himself and hand you the other half. So that later on, not only is the half of the bill with a signature on it in the lemon, but they take them, the signature and the bill match up at the end. And that's how you can treat a little bit larger or, uh, or oddball cur uh, currency. But those aren't going to show up too often. Most of the time, you'll get a bill that you can handle, I would say very easily, 99% of the time. So that's a little bit about how you can adapt some of the foreign currencies or odd-shaped money into the pen. Now let's take a look at some other examples of some foreign currency. Right here we have uh, an Australian dollar and uh, a 20 euro. Uh, these are both uh, 20 dollar uh, denominations and they both are about the same size. Uh, the euro, just like the uh, Australian dollar, graduates uh, from the 5, then the 10 gets a little bigger, the 20 gets a little bigger, and the 100 gets a little bigger. So uh, what you want to do, a 20 is a nice size to use. Uh, you can also use the 100. Just adapt the folds. Uh, you want to go over a third and a third, and then in half, remembering to keep this distance shorter than the distance of the, uh, the slit there for the, uh, the bill to travel out of. That's our American dollar. We want to take the euro then and roll it just the same way we do the American dollar down in a nice tight package, and then that will easily slide into the final answer pen and will easily load out, just like that. Now, the Australian money is a bit different in that it's printed on a, a plastic type of paper, so it's a little stiffer. Uh, in order to do that, you'll notice it's pretty much the same size as the euro. Uh, again, you would fold it in thirds, keeping in mind your uh, distance, then fold it down in half. Remember, that still has to be smaller than that dimension. Now, because this is plastic, it tends to want to unroll. So you have to keep a nice tight grip as you're rolling the Australian dollar because it does have a tendency to want to unwind. And as you see, you just place it in and it goes in as well uh, to be used. A little tip uh, that you can use as well, and this will, will be helpful in, in loading, uh, sometimes when you roll it's inevitable that a corner will, will start to try to unravel. All you do is place it in and, and twist and go with the grain there. Just kind of go with the grain and it will roll in nice and smooth. Here's a hot tip for you. Let's say you're in a situation, you're set up to use a dummy bill on a piece of American currency that's obviously green, and someone hands you a 20 euro, which is red. What do you do? Well, if you feel like it, you can try to get away with it, but uh, what I'd rather see is that you simply press the plunger in your pocket and unload that green bill, do the fold with the red, and simply do a behind-the-envelope load to get rid of that uh, euro instead of trying to switch it for a dummy bill. The nice thing about the final answer pen is that you can use it on the fly like that and simply adapt your method while you're there and get out of that situation. That's not going to happen to you too often, but just in case it does, you'll be ready for it. A gaffing the lemon is something that you're going to want to do before the show. Now you can gaff one lemon, two lemons, the whole bowl of lemons, as many as you want, or as many as you need. Now let me tell you a little bit about how the, I came up with this. Uh, I was working at Malone's Magic Bar, and as I had said previously, I was doing the torn corner method. But I had to set up lemon after lemon after lemon, sometimes 12 a night. So I started experimenting with lemons and uh, the way they look, and being in Florida, I had a treasure trove of lemons to choose from. Uh, so I wanted to find a way to be able to get that money in there without it being detected and so that people could casually examine the lemon and they wouldn't see it. So what I devised I call a star trap. Now a star trap is actually a theatrical device. You can read about it in uh, the Jarrett book. But it's a trap door cut in the floor in the shape of a star or an asterisk so that an actor can jump on it and <laughs> drop right through the floor and disappear. What the star trap does for the lemon or the orange or whatever type of fruit you're using, uh, it allows the money to penetrate the skin, let the flaps of that star go in, 
and then when you squeeze, almost like a coin purse, the flaps kind of come back together again and resemble a whole lemon. Now let me show you the right kind of lemon to choose for this. It's very important which lemons you use. This particular lemon is a bad lemon. And it's a bad lemon because it has this raised, bumpy surface on the end where it grows out of the tree. That's the actual pip where it grows from. It's kind of big. I have used this type of lemon in an emergency if I can't get them. And I can show you how to adapt that lemon a little bit later in case that's the only one you have. Uh, but for right now, let's deal with the ideal situation. You have your pick of lemons. You're going to gaff them before the show. Everything's cool. What you want to do is you want to find a lemon that is like one of these lemons. Let's just use these three for example. Now these lemons are flat on the top. There's no bump. There's no ridge. The pip is right in line with the top surface of that fruit. It is on this one. On this one you can see there is just a little tiny bit of a bump, but not enough to affect this particular load. And this lemon over here is more than perfect. It even goes in a little bit, which is exactly what you want. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this goes in a little bit, which is great. Any of these particular lemons that have a flat surface are what you're going to want to use for the star trap. Now also I'll talk about the texture of the lemons too. Uh, this lemon being a little darker is actually softer. It's more ripe than this lemon of a lighter color. And even this lemon here, which still has a little bit of green in it, is even less ripe. It's, uh, it's still ripening. You can see because of the green here around the edges. Uh, the skin on this lemon, this type of lemon, tends to be a little firmer than these. These have sort of softened in. They've aged. They've matured. They're more pliable. Uh, whereas this is a newer lemon, uh, fresh off the tree, the skin is pretty hard. You want to try to avoid a hard lemon too, but again, I can show you how to accommodate a hard lemon if you run into one of those and that's your only available choice. Now, I have a lemon pre-cut here with a star trap in it. And if you look at it very casually all the way around, it looks like a regular lemon with no cuts, no breaks, no holes whatsoever. But if you look very, very, very closely and scrutinize this, you can see some slits, very, very small slits here in the end of the lemon. So the slits run this way, this way, and this way. I'm going to draw the star pattern for you so you can exactly see how it's cut. I make slices. I make one slice this way. I make one slice this way. And I make one slice this way, which forms an asterisk. It forms a, a star pattern. Now I'll cut along those lines and show you exactly what it looks like. You're going to cut here by putting the end of the knife in. Just cut across. And you want to use a knife that has a very sharp point when you're doing this. Sometimes you can even use an X-Acto knife if you like. So you're basically going to create six pieces of pie here, just like that. Now I have one that I pre-cut earlier, and I'll show you exactly what that looks like. This one has been pre-cut with that star trap. That was the one I showed you earlier. There's the flaps. There's one here, one here, one here, 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 and here. Now what you want to do is create a channel down inside the lemon. And I figured, okay, now that I've got the skin coming back up into place, now I know that that's going to close up, I need to create a channel that, so that the bill can be received easily. And rather than a fancy gimmick or something, you know, uh, like, a, like a rod, I just use the end of a Sharpie to create this channel. What I do is I take the Sharpie, put it at the end, and make sure that all the flaps of that star are being shoved into the lemon. I make sure that they're all going in. They're all folded down, all six flaps. Then I twist it around a little bit. Sometimes I do it a little more and widen it up if the lemon's a little tough. 
Then I just pull that out, wipe it off, and now I've created an indentation or a channel all the way through, all the way through the lemon. Now it's just a simple matter to squeeze the edges and the lemon goes back into place because of that star trap. It closes up. Now what that allows to happen is a bill that has been pre-folded inside the pen in the action of taking the cap off the pen you have the lemon in your hand the pen comes toward the end of the lemon here the button is pressed and here's what happens it actually injects that lemon with the money just like that when you're injecting it because it sticks out a little bit further it's going to push that money all the way inside the lemon and now when you squeeze the flaps the star trap is going to close over it so that it looks like it's completely sealed sometimes if I have a rather small lemon that I'm working with I'll even leave the rolled up green part of the money sticking out because upon casual examination that just looks like a pip anyway but if you want it all the way in and you want to squeeze that star trap so it closes up now that lemon can be examined by everyone looked at it and examined casually it just looks like a real lemon now the nice thing about this is that because you've created the channel when you go to cut that lemon open it's going to be cut exactly around the center you're going to spin 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 when you take that apart you've got a perfect picture of that money poking out of the lemon just like that. It can then be opened up and shown to be the same signed bill. Now let's talk for just a few moments about uh, problem lemons. <laughs> uh, this particular lemon uh, is a problem lemon because the skin is a little bit harder. Now depending on what situation you do this in, when I used to do it at Malone's I used to produce two lemons out of a chop cup and have somebody pick one. Uh, and um, in this situation, to create the star trap, I would pop off the pip. I would go ahead and make my cuts. One, two, and three. Then I would push down a little bit to make sure that that starts going inside. Now, as you can see, because of the thick skin, it's starting to split just a little bit here. So let's see what happens with this lemon when we uh, try to create that channel. See, some of them want to pop up. Some of those want to pop up. We want to try to make sure they all go down inside the lemon. All right? That's not too bad for a, for a crappy lemon there. All right? Now I can bring the end of this up a little bit more with the knife. And now I've got something that looks pretty good. So now, this bill's a little wet, but it should still work. We'll place that down inside the pen. So now when this comes up against here, it's pressed and loaded, the pen is recapped, and you've got the end like that. It just takes a little push, a little push, a little push, and you end up with a lemon that looks just like that. You can even use your finger to shove it in a little bit more. Now, let's say you end up getting the lemon in there. You're in a close-up situation, and something like this happens. You just get a little glitch or a little thing there. All I do in that situation is I take the lemon, it comes out of the chop cup and I would just give it a little spin and by giving it a spin you're in effect showing the lemon all the way around and then you just stop it and keep your thumb over the hole to show it to him that was a little technique that I developed uh, when the star trap was in its infancy and was still a little, uh, a little f uh, flexible so now you can cut this open and show that the money is inside this lemon as well when you're cutting it also you can keep that away from the spectators now let me talk just for a moment about uh, the spectator cutting the lemon open. When you have a good enough star trap and you've got it to where you can close those flaps right over it, your lemon is good, everything's cool, you can actually have the spectator take this thing and cut it open himself. Now in a stage routine, that tends to slow the impact down. Uh, you know, you're, you're trugging along, you're trugging along, there's a lemon, oh my god it's a lemon, but what's inside? Da, 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 da. Now if I hand this to the spectator and they're going, Okay, you have to instruct them how to cut it, and you have to talk them through it. And uh, so usually what I say is I say, 
cut down about halfway to the center and then turn it. Cut down about halfway to the center and turn it. Cut down about halfway to the center and turn it. And I'm guiding them all along. What I prefer to do is to actually hold the lemon, give them the knife, and instruct them to cut either along a line that I've drawn or tell them to cut in the center of the lemon and then I turn the lemon for them. And sometimes I'll just take the knife, hold the lemon like this, cut it open myself all the way around, cutting it open fairly as possible, as evenly as possible, right? making sure everything's fair and open, and then doing the joke 26 to the left, 4 to the right, and 6 back to the left, and then pop that off and show it. One more problem lemon I wanted to talk about and just in case you can't uh, find any other lemon besides one that's hideous like this to use, uh, here's what you can do to get around it. You can actually use the pen itself as a, uh, a coring device. What you can do is put that directly over the pip and use some pressure to spin it and cut a channel in that lemon skin and then pull it out. You can pry that part out that you've just cored and then once you do that you should penetrate down enough into there that you can get all the little pieces out. You've created a hole then you can take the regular Sharpie jam it down in there and create a channel like that. Now this does give you a lemon with a hole in it. You're not going to get a star trap if you use this. And the reason you don't is because all the pieces are very difficult. They're above the surface of the lemon. They can't go inside. But believe me, this even is not noticed by people when you handle it properly. If you're doing the close-up routine, you simply leave the lemon sitting on the table like that with it facing back towards you. If you're doing the stage routine, when the spectator pulls the lemon out of the bag, you simply take it from them and display it fairly and openly like this. The lemon can still be loaded the same way. The money inside the pen injected into the lemon. All you have to do is make sure that you cover that opening. But in the best situation, in the ideal situation, the star trap is what you want to use. When I did this in Malone's, originally I would load the lemon into the star trap in my pocket. Uh, but when I decided to move this to the stage, that's when this gaff and the star trap came together to create a devastating effect. So have fun with that. Practice cutting lemons open. Uh, you'll go through a bunch of them before you get it perfectly. Uh, and then once you have those traps cut and you've mastered that, then simply practice the loading part, which is what we're going to go over next. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about some other options uh, besides a lemon. Uh, a lemon is pretty interesting because it's, uh, it's such an odd shape, uh, it's, uh, it's sour, uh, it's easily recognizable, uh, and it seems so pure. Uh, but there are other things that you can load the, the money into as well. Uh, for instance, uh, a pear uh, works pretty well. Uh, in order to do the pear, uh, right up through the bottom, you're just going to use the end of the pen to core it out. Uh, and uh, load it the same way, right up through the bottom like that. Uh, you can use uh, a banana as well. Uh, use the uh, pen to just cut out a little core in the back. Uh, just keep your thumb over it. So when you go to load the banana, do that. Peel it down, crack the banana off, and it's poking out of the meat of the banana. Uh, one thing that uh, I use quite a bit, I usually flip back and forth between lemon and orange. Most of the time, when you're working in a venue, uh, like let's say a cruise ship or a casino or, or a, a hotel, oranges are readily available in their whole state. You can easily walk up and pluck one off the buffet. Uh, you can grab one. They're usually in fruit bowls on the reception desk. You can, they're, they're all around. Lemons, because they're more of a seasoning, more of a uh, specialty kind of thing, they're usually cut up at the bar 
or uh, cut in half and used for the fish. So lemons are not easily as accessible uh, in the venues you're going to be working in than oranges are. Uh, and of course, you can go to the grocery store before you, you go, but usually if I know I'm going to be working in a place that's going to have fruit, like a hotel or a casino or a cruise ship, I just get the fruit there. Uh, it's a lot easier. Uh, and another benefit of the orange versus the lemon is an orange pretty much has a pre-cut channel in it just because of the way an orange is designed. Uh, in order to do the orange, just pop off the pip. Uh, you can cut a very sloppy star trap because the uh, orange skin comes back much better than the lemon skin does. Uh, and uh, what you do is take that pen once again, your Sharpie, just jam it down in there and pull it right back out. It already has a pre-cut channel and as you can see it already starts to close up without very much massaging at all and that's done. An orange is also a little less sloppy than a lemon uh, and uh, it also uh, is, uh, is round. There's something nice about the roundness of it and the orange and green uh, image that you get when you pull the top of that off. So I'll show you what an orange would look like. Uh, let's say we're going to do uh, uh, the orange. The, the money gets loaded and I'll go over the loading techniques and in uh, the next segment. But that gets loaded into there. Uh, you show the orange. There it is. Now we're going to cut this open. So you can spin the orange. You can show it all around. It's an orange. Uh, as you can see right here, I'll point this out, that actually does look very much like a pip upon casual examination. Uh, if you really want it to be uh, retentive about it, you can push that down in there a little further and squeeze the star trap and have it uh, covered by the, uh, the pieces like that, but it's not really necessary. Now to cut this open, go back and forth like this all the way around, all the way around, all the way around like that, and now I usually give it a break like that, give it a twist which breaks any parts that you've missed, just a little twist breaks the cut, pop that off, and now you've got a very lovely picture of the uh, bill and the orange. Nice thing about the orange too, for some reason, uh, because of the orange juice, it, the bill, as you can see, wants to open up a little bit and gives you a little bit wider uh, picture there. Uh, it started to open up there. So, uh, so that's the orange, it can be another option. Uh, you could even, if you pre-cut a hole in the plastic, uh, you could load it into a Twinkie. Uh, you could load it into a kiwi fruit. Uh, you could actually even uh, load it into an egg. Uh, let's say you, uh, you were going to do uh, the trick with the egg and the money was going to appear in the egg uh, if a bill were loaded into the pen. We'll just load it down in here like this. You could use the end of the pen to uh, crack the egg and inject the money into the egg like that and dump it out or finish cracking it and show that the money is inside the egg. There's a lot of possibilities that you can use with it, but uh, the most practical purposes and the best ones that i found are to use this for the orange or the lemon. Uh, now we'll get into the specific loading techniques and switches. Now I'd like to talk about the in-the-hand switch. Uh, this is one of the first things that I came up with when using the pen as a switching device. Now the idea is that the pen is loaded with a bill and the bill is folded in that first way that I showed you a few moments ago. It's the smaller fold, smaller packet. That is folded while the bill is in the hand. In my original version, the bill was already loaded in the pen. The pen was given to the spectator. The spectator signed their name on the bill. I had them hold it up and show everyone as I recapped the pen, I simply used my thumb to slide the bill out and into finger palm. Now when I retrieved the bill from the spectator, I folded it, folded it, folded it, folded it, folded it, like this. Now the pen is here, the bill has been folded into a tight packet, I said, now we folded it into a nice tight wad. Do you know what a tight wad is? Turn. As I turned and the laugh came, I simply shoved the bill in the pen and brought this one into view. That's how it looked. Uh, bill went into the pen, 
other one came into view. That was it. That was my original switch uh, with a smaller fold. There is a downside to that in that uh, it is a smaller fold. As much of the uh, bill as possible doesn't poke out. Uh, but if you're doing something like an egg, that might be a nice switch for you. Uh, then, uh, Larry Davidson uh, emailed Bob and said, why don't you do it like the uh, Tim Conover and Scotty York bill in cigarette uh, and have the bill previously loaded in the pen. So Bob took that idea and ran with it. Uh, so using Thomas's fold and Larry's concept and uh, my idea for the pen, actually you're getting the benefit of uh, a lot of people's brains, including uh, Malini's and everyone else's uh, that's finally come up with this. So, uh, so a lot of good minds have gone into this. In the version that Bob finally fleshed out, uh, the, uh, the money is folded up uh, in the fold that uh, Thomas Wayne came up with and is loaded into the pen. The bill is borrowed from the spectator and is folded while the dummy bill, the one you're going to switch out, is still loaded in the pen. It's folded here, it's folded here, it's folded down, remembering to keep it nice and tight. Folded here, here, and rolled, and rolled, and rolled, and held nice and tight like this. Now this is almost held uh, like you would display uh, the end of a cigarette. Now the hands are tipped like this to show both hands completely empty. That's a typical Bob Kohler gesture being extra fair, making sure everybody uh, has no opportunity to question anything at all. Now the hands come together and as the hands come together to relax, the bill is loaded out of the pen and into finger palm here. Okay. And that's, the, uh, that's what you end up with. Now, the button is retracted just a bit to allow the, uh, to accommodate for the bill. And this is moved into a position like the Slidini uh, cigarette display, where you have a very, uh, both bills in a, in a vertical fashion here, right against each other. Okay. So now, when the hand comes together, again to gesture and again you can be pretty fair with this the hand comes together whether you're going to do the tightwad joke or make a comment or ask the spectator a question on that beat the hands simply come together this bill is pushed into the other end of the pen like that the pen the pinky here is used to pull the pen against the hand like that and the bill is stroked like this just to display it. And that's all there is to the switch. Now there's a lot going on there, but let me show you what it should look like in fast motion. Uh, about three quarter speed here. So you've rolled it up, you've showed them this, you've given them this look. The hands come together and the bill is loaded into finger palm. It's maneuvered to that position. The hands come together, the bill is simply stroked, and the pinky moves it, and that's all there is to it. The switch is done. The bill that's signed is loaded into the pen now, and in plain view of the audience, you've just switched for a dummy bill. Now there are many ways in which to get the bill into the final answer pen. You'll probably discover a few on your own, but here are a couple of my favorites. Here is uh, the switch that I do uh, in my routine right now. Number one, because I don't have to prepare anything. All I do is stick the pen in my pocket, uh, a couple of envelopes, and I'm done. I don't have to worry about anything. Uh, and uh, the heat's off at that moment because there's a great joke to cover it. So here's what I do. Uh, you're going to go, ah, oh, come on, nobody buys that. But it, it really goes by people. Um, I have these envelopes, and these are coin envelopes. Uh, and the reason I switched these, originally I started doing this with a larger, uh, like, I think they're three by five envelopes or three by four envelopes. I switched to these smaller ones just because it made sense that if I was rolling the bill up into a packet like this, I wouldn't put it into a gigantic envelope. But uh, no one ever questioned it when I did it, but just for my own personal sake and making this as uh, justified and as uh, logical as possible, I switched to the smaller envelopes because just that looks like it fits in there a lot easier. Uh, that you could just take that and just slide it down inside the envelope there. So here is what I do. Uh, the pen that I have just retrieved from the spectator 
hey, thanks, Bob. Thanks for signing that. I recap it, and it goes into a grip that I just kind of hold with my pinky here, just so it's out of the way and my fingers are free to do other things. Magicians do this kind of stuff all the time. You know, we're, we're, we put a card here while we're messing around with the deck. So uh, it's perfectly natural to do that. Uh, so that just kind of hangs out right about here uh, in the hand. That's, that's the grip that I use. Uh, now, I have handed these envelopes to the spectator to hold on to for me. I say these two envelopes are sealed. This one is not sealed. I'm going to ask you for that one in just a minute. So they have this ready to go. Now the spectator hands this to me, uh, and all I do, I've got the bill rolled up here. It's already ready to go. It's been rolled up. I say, hand me the, uh, the envelope. I take the envelope. Now here's what I do. I grip it between my first finger and middle finger, and I place it into a position that the pen rides up, and behind. Then my fingers cause the envelope to curl so it looks like it's open from the front side. And sometimes as a subtlety I'll just casually bring it up to my face and blow as if I were opening it. So in reality the pen is in this position behind the envelope. The cap they can just barely see sticking out but since it's black it matches up against the code and it, it should be there anyway if I was holding it that way, so it really is, uh, is well disguised. Then I simply take the money, bring it over like this, and place it right into the end of the pen, right into there, and ordinarily it would stick there, so I place it in and let go, and then push it in the rest of the way. Now I simply reach over, take this up to the guy's lips, and go lick that for me, or stick out your tongue. Okay? That's simply how it goes. It's back here. I slip it in. I say, stick out your tongue. That gets a laugh from the audience. Knocks everybody off guard. So stick out your tongue, laugh, move the envelope, and move the pen. And you want to keep the pen angled back away from the audience so that uh, this doesn't flash to them, uh, although it melts in with the other gray and really uh, goes by. But if, you're, if you uh, want to actually be 100% on this, just make sure you keep that angled back. Now, everyone thinks the bill is in here, uh, except there's actually a business card or seeds or whatever you want to use uh, in the envelope to reveal at the end. Then the guy licks it, you close it up, mix it with the other envelopes, and now you have a pen in your hand, and there's a logical reason for you to have had a pen in your hand the whole time, because now you're going to number the envelopes. Uh, and Terry Seabrook has a wonderful uh, gag. Uh, he does, uh, I'm going to number them in French, uh, un, deux, uh, three, and double deux. Uh, sometimes I've said uh, un, deux, three, and deux, deux. Uh, and then I say, you know, take the doo doo and put it in your pants or whatever, whatever you're going to do. You can make all kinds of jokes. Um, for those of you who enjoy justification, uh, and sometimes I get in those moods uh, where, you know, you just say, well, why is the money in a lemon? Well... For those of you uh, who are into that, and I've sort of been into that mood lately, uh, I've used a slot machine premise where I've drawn a small sketch of a lemon, uh, a small sketch of cherries, and a small sketch of an orange. Uh, basically, um, here I'll draw it on this, all three on the envelopes for you. Uh, the lemon that I draw basically looks like this, right? And then the cherries are two circles like that with a leaf on them, and then the orange is just a big circle with some dots on it like that. Uh, so those are the, uh, the different fruits that I draw on the envelopes. And that way when the guy actually picks the envelope, and I just use equivoque for him to, to select the envelope, uh, sometimes I'll even go like this. I'll say, uh, I want you to choose any envelope. It doesn't matter which one. Just uh, go ahead and choose this one. And I'm just wiggling the, uh, the lemon envelope. And uh, eventually he'll grab it. If he goes for these, you go, <clears throat> you know, just make him take the lemon envelope, uh, however way you're going to do it. Uh, and then uh, that way when he opens the lemon envelope and finds phew, nothing in there or seeds or your business card or whatever it's going to be, uh, then at the end when the lemon comes out of the audience, uh, you say, well, you picked the right envelope after all because there's been a lemon in the bag the whole time. Isn't that fantastic? Go back to your seat. Yay. Uh, so, uh, so that's a little justification that you can use there that I've used. Um, 
If you're going to use this trick with uh, Doug Malloy's lemon game to make a cleaner load, uh, then the justification's already built in for you in his whole routine with the, the funny cards and, and uh, all the little uh, props that you get there with it. Um, now, let me show you another way uh, to do a load. Uh, in this particular way, uh, this is something that a friend of mine, Keith Stickley, uh, showed me. What you can do is take a razor blade, take your coin envelope, and just make a slit about halfway down, just a little bit bigger than the pen itself. Now that can uh, open up so you can see. I'll show it to the camera so you can get a good look at it. It uh, opens up about like that. Now the uh, pen can be loaded up into this slit. Now this can be preset in your pocket if you like. And for the beginning of the routine, you can use a real Sharpie. Uh, they can sign their name with a real Sharpie. Uh, da, 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 there you go. We're going to take this. Uh, and then you fold the money up with a real Sharpie. Get it into the nice uh, tight wad here. Uh, then you say, in my pocket, I have an envelope. Now when you're reaching your pocket, you've got the pen in this position. And I usually say, in my pocket, I have an envelope. Everyone sees the pen. My hand goes down into my pocket, and all I'm doing in my pocket is I'm leaving this pen and coming out with the envelope and this pen. It's coming right out of my pocket. So nothing looks like it's changed except for the fact that I've added an envelope. And as you can see, it's really running up through the slit. I've just switched the Sharpie in my pocket, and uh, that's the, uh, the look that we come out with. Now, <clears throat> for those of you who really, really want to be super fair about this, you can now come out and show that the money is literally going into the front of that envelope. When in reality, it's really going through and into the final answer pen. All right? So now, all you're going to do is, I'll show this from the back, you come away and you say, stick out your tongue. This just slides right out as you approach the guy with both hands and rub that on his tongue. A lot of people say, well, wait a minute, they're going to see that the bill is rolled up here in the end of the pen. Well, you just approach their face, and when this is close to your face and they're licking it, it's past their line of sight, so there's no way they're going to see it. It's down here by their cheek. So don't worry about that. Uh, and after all, again, it's just a pen. Nobody cares. Uh, sometimes in my routines, I'll you know, make a bit about sniffing the ink, and oh, well, that was rude. You want some? Uh, so I just handle this casually like a pen. I don't even think about it uh, because they don't think about it. To touch the lemon or not to touch the lemon? That is the question. <laughs> well, for those purists out there who never want the lemon to be touched, this is the way to do it. Uh, I think it's kind of neat that you don't actually touch the lemon in the routine. Uh, and here's the way I accomplish that. Uh, we already have a lemon pre-cut with a star trap. Uh, now I'll talk about the one that you saw on the uh, actual routine. This is a Ziploc uh, sandwich bag, but it really isn't a Ziploc sandwich bag. It's a cheap, 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 low-end, <laughs> uh, store brand, junky old bag. Uh, get the lowest quality ones you can find because the skin is the thinnest. Uh, with those particular type of bags. It'll still go through a Ziploc, but it'll go through this much easier. Uh, the lemon, of course, is sealed inside the bag. Doesn't really matter how it's oriented, but I like to take as much air out of the bag as possible uh, while it's sealed in there. That way you have a little bit more access to the proper side of the lemon uh, to load it. Then, take that lemon and place it in a paper bag. Something about a plastic bag and a paper bag. It's pretty organic. Uh, it doesn't look phony. I have used a Crown Royal bag or a Seagram's bag before, but there's just something organic about a paper bag. Uh, then you, you want to take it and staple it shut. I just carry this little mini stapler with me. Uh, and that really seals it all the way across the top. And that can go out in the audience and be there. Now, the stapling really accomplishes two things. One, it helps to sell the impossibility. Wow, that thing was stapled. And it keeps the audience guy from screwing around and looking in there and see what's going on. So uh, it actually has a double purpose. Uh, another thing that you can do too, uh, because of the star trap, 
the actual fruit will undergo a great deal of scrutiny. So uh, you can actually just take the lemon and put it in one of those plastic grocery bags that comes from the uh, comes from the store. Uh, in this case, I have an orange in here, uh, and uh, it's actually what they come in when you pick them up from the store, so you might as well utilize it. Uh, that'll work for that as well. Now, the money, of course, is loaded in the pen at this position. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, actual switches and uh, how you get the money in there in a little while. Uh, but right now, I want to show you uh, how this particular loading sequence works. Uh, I take the bag from the guy and tear the top off. And I usually say something like, there's your deposit, right? Which gets a little laugh. I don't know why that's funny, uh, but Bob Kohler said it would be funny, and it's funny. So there you go. Uh, now what you do uh, is you have the guy look inside and tell you what's in there, or you can have him reach inside and take it out, however you're going to use this. Uh, usually I'll have the guy reach in and take it out and show it's a lemon, which usually gets a what the hell is that about kind of laugh. Um, then uh, you're going to want to take the lemon. Now you'll notice that I'm not physically touching the lemon. There is a barrier, a plastic barrier between me and the lemon. So no one thinks that, uh, that anything's going on yet. So you're way ahead of everyone. So what you want to do is just maneuver the lemon into a position. Uh, really, it doesn't take a lot of maneuvering uh, because there's not a lot of air. The lemon will pretty much stay oriented the way you want it to be oriented, like that. All I'll do now is take that, squeeze it so that it jumps over there to the end. Now, in the particular room that I saw, I usually uh, that you saw, I usually say um, I'm going to sign this for you to make it more valuable. How do you spell sucker? That's the joke that covers the loading moment. And the loading moment is going to get loaded right through this plastic bag. It's going to create a small little puncture hole while it's loaded right into the lemon. So here's how it'll look. I'll do it in slow motion for you so you can pick it up. The pen is usually up here. I will say, I will maneuver, hold the lemon in this position. I will usually say, I'm going to make this even more valuable for you. I'm going to autograph it. How do you spell sucker? As I'm saying, how do you spell sucker, the hands come together and the end of the pen is pressed right against there. When the audience starts to laugh, that's when I push. Now I've just pierced, let me try to stop here and show you. This has actually pierced the plastic bag and is being forced down inside the lemon. So, how do you spell sucker? All that is driven home right there into the fruit, as you can see. Now the bag, part of the bag is still wrapped around the lemon a little bit. All it takes is usually just a little squeeze and that comes right out. Now there is a very small puncture hole near the edge of the bag, but when that's displayed, it really doesn't read to the audience. Looks like the bag's completely sealed. The same thing applies to the orange. How do you spell sucker? Laugh. And now to follow through, uh, here's what's actually happening. Here's the action that you're trying to accomplish. How do you spell sucker? Load, twist, take the cap off, and put it on as if you were going to write. That's the gesture. Here, here, and here, and you're going to write. That's all it takes to get that loaded in there. Something that helps facilitate that load is that Thomas has put uh, little ridges, uh, so you get a little gription, you get a little grab here on the ridges. Uh, that way there's just a little bit of extra friction, a little bit of extra friction that allows you to push that uh, money out of there and load it. So now, boom, that load is done. No, I'm just kidding. You can put the pen away. And in just a minute, I'm going to show you another way that you actually do touch the lemon, but it goes by them as well to, to load. But this is the no-touch version. It's been in the plastic bag the whole time, yes? Yes. I haven't physically come in contact with the lemon, yes? Yes. In fact, I'm not going to touch the lemon at all. You're going to cut through the bag. Then I just simply roll the bag around like this, and I have the spectator take the knife and cut right through the bag. 
right? It's sealed for your protection. There's no way I can touch it. So the spectator now cuts in, and I rotate. The spectator cuts in, and I rotate it. He cuts, and I rotate it, and then I rotate it, so he just cuts right through that uh, Ziploc safety seal part there. Boom. Now it's been cut open physically while it's inside the bag, okay? There's no way that I've actually touched it. Then I'll usually flip it over, take that away, right? Now I've exposed the lemon. This is the first time the bag's been cut open. I haven't come anywhere near it. Now the spectator can reach over, so you still don't touch it. The spectator can reach over and pull the top of that off, and you've got the lemon uh, right there with the money poking out of it plain as day. Uh, this goes away as he opens it up, and you're good to go. Uh, that's actually the no-touch version. Now, with the orange, I'll show you uh, the second way that I've done this. In this particular version, you actually do have to touch the fruit, but uh, I don't really mind that at all because it's done on such the offbeat, uh, such the odd moment that uh, it, uh, it goes by the folks when you're doing it. Here's how the second one would work. You get this up. This is in your pocket. Okay? Uh, now, you haven't done anything. You just take the bag, take it out of there. Now, let's tear this open. They tear it open. And by the way, you can load through these bags easier than you can load through that bag with the, uh, <laughs> with the uh, pen. Uh, you can also load through aluminum foil very easily. <laughs> Poke it right through the aluminum foil. So if you have something wrapped up in there, go to town. Now, here's something that I've also used. Uh, I'll say, it's an orange, and you get to take that home as a souvenir. I'll autograph it. How do you spell sucker? I've used that moment here. And I've also used something, and this is particularly effective uh, in the... Uh, and the idea that, that you're going to cut this in half because you don't want to damage anything that might be inside. And the way I do this is I say, now we're going to draw a line around the pen so that you can cut this directly, or a li line around the orange, so you can cut this directly in half. Now I've just loaded it. I've taken the cap off, and all I do is I put the pen against the orange, and I just kind of spin it like this. We're going to draw a line, and I want you, Mr. Spectator, to cut along this dotted line and follow it exactly. Now the pen has come out. You've just drawn the line. The spectator then can take it and physically cut it along the line if you want him to. You can hold on to it and do that spinning idea that I've used before. But now you've drawn a line. You have a perfect excuse to ring in the pen at that point to draw the line to make sure this is cut exactly in half because you wouldn't want to damage anything in there. It's turned, it's pulled off, and there is the money inside. Uh, I really like the line ruse, the idea to draw the line. The pen comes out at the perfect moment. It's set in there. It's a good way to do it. So uh, that's the actual loading sequence for the bill in the orange or the lemon. Thank you.